When most people think about money, which is absolutely one of the one of the first things you, you should think about. But retirement in and of itself is an entire change of life. Your entire world becomes completely different. I, I think the best example of that is people who retire, their entire identity is around uh, a business. Then all of a sudden, they're not the leader. They're not the this. And what do you do with yourself then? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I talk to people about this all the time. And in fact, um, we, we have situations where, let's say you're head of an HR department, for instance, you had 90 to 100 people reporting to you. And all of a sudden, you decide you're going to retire. You wake up the next morning, and the only person you're retiring to is your wife. Yeah. And, and, and that happens every day. And there's, nobody, there's no schedule for you. There's uh, no, no business trips to go on, nothing to do. You just wake up and you say, you, you're waiting for someone to come into, the, into your bedroom or into your, um, into your living room to say, hey, I need you to do something. And there's not that many people that are asking you to do anything anymore. And it's a very helpless feeling sometimes. Sure, yeah. But you're right. Retiring is so much more than just the money part. Yeah, and who was it, though? Remember the movie About Schmidt? Right. Yeah, the, the same thing. Uh, you know, there he was. His entire identity was with who he was as a businessman all of his life, you know, leading a company. Now, all of a sudden, he's not. He didn't even have a wife. So that even, uh, that even. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So but all, you know what's, what's even, what, what, what I find even more compelling is, and this is, I, I find it the most important question that we have with clients these days, is we'll be sitting down with somebody who's planning to retire, may, perhaps their wife was working, perhaps the husband was working, it doesn't matter which one was working. And all of a sudden the two of them realize that they're about to spend the next 30 years together without the other one going off to work. Mm. And so the question that I ask of them is, so tell me what the two of you like doing together. And all of a sudden there's this, uh, this horrible silence because most couples don't realize what they really enjoy doing together after 30 years of watching the kids grow up, running their own independent lives, collectively they have to go back to the date when they were courting, when they were dating, when they were just engaged, and remembering what it is that they loved each other and it brought them together. Now they're doing this 30, 40 years later, and it's a little bit different. Sure, and I think when you, when you really come down to it, people plan X amount of dollars, etc., but the economy changes. What we're looking at today may not be there in 10, 15 years, 20 years when somebody is going to retire. So we don't know what the dollar value is going to be. And in addition to that, your spending habits. You know, let's, let's pick a number. It takes me $1,000 a month to live. But what if that exact $1,000 20 years from now is going to cost $5,000? You're getting the same thing, and you're getting it five times as much. Those are the things to take into consideration. That's why when it comes to retirement, my advice to anybody is don't do it by yourself. You go to the to the, to the specialist who knows about being a genius. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Because then well, I, I really... Go ahead. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, I need somebody as the average person to hold my hand and lead me through it. Well, well, one of the reasons that we wrote Retiring for the Genius is that we felt, or I felt, and when my father started this firm in 1968, he's one of the original financial planners in the, in the world, actually. Um, and I've been with him, I joined him in 1992. We, we've found that we've developed a niche here in our office of a bunch of clients and types of people that we serve that I think a lot of great financial planners serve all around this country. And they're what I call the mass affluent baby boomer. Now, ask your listeners this question. Perhaps you're over, if you're over between, uh, if you're between the ages of 50 and 75, if in retirement you hope to spend between four and $10,000 a month, and as you approach retirement, you have a collective net worth, including your house, of between a half a million and $2 million, you uh, yeah five hundred thousand to two million dollars. You fall into the mass affluent baby boomer category. There's twenty two and a half million people like that, and these are the people that worry about everything from what's the best way to take social security, what is Medicare, how do I begin drawing income from my investments, what will I do to keep myself busy in retirement, and also can I afford to help my kids when they run into troubled times without sacrificing my own retirement? That's why we wrote this book. That's what we gave. We have the skills for people in retiring for the genius. We give those skills. We give those lessons on how to do it. Now, by the way, um, one of the things that one of, one of the things that everybody gets hit with, and most people have no idea what it is. You know the name of it, but you don't know how it works. And most employers say this is what you should get: the four hundred one k. Everybody wants a four hundred one k. That's stability, but that's not really so, is it? No, a four hundred one k isn't stability. I mean, a pension is, in a sense, for the most part, stability. Yet the drawback on a pension is that there's no inflation protection. 
What a 401k becomes when you retire is an enormous amount of money, probably more money, a larger check than you've ever seen handed to you before in your life. And you're expected to make that money stretch long enough that it can provide you with enough income along with your other sources, let's say Social Security or something else, for the rest of your life. And it is an enormous responsibility. You know, I've got one word, Mark, to, uh, to respond to what you just said. Sure. <laughs> You're going to make yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, but, but that's why many people choose to hire somebody. And it can be a dangerous step. Look, there's lots of people that are out there that would love to get their hands on your money and give you advice in the direction that they think you should go in. Well, I'll tell you this. Before you start hiring anybody, there's one primary filter that you should always consider when looking to hire someone to give you advice in your financial life, and that is a certified financial planner designation. The CFP designation is the gold standard of this industry. People with this designation have to abide by what are called the four E's, education and examination, ethics and experience. You see, just because you get a CFP designation doesn't mean you can start using it right away. You have to have real life and ongoing field experience. Mm-hmm. Well, but you just said the, the magic words, field experience. You can go to college and all the academic background in the world is wonderful, but knowledge in and of itself doesn't get you anywhere. There's no power in it. It's the application of the knowledge. That's the wisdom. That's the field experience. That's exactly right. I mean, in college, I mean, there's a lot of, co- you can get a great education in college, but it's generally academic knowledge. Sure. There's not as much, pra- I mean, sure, there's a lot of colleges that will use the Harvard Business Reviews and a lot of case studies and all that kind of stuff. But until you're really involved in the day-to-day operations of a business, you don't have that practical skill set. And frankly, age is one of those things that gives you that experience and that wisdom. Sure. And it's real important. Well, one of the things that I do mention in the book, Retiring for the Genius, is the fact that all of these spreadsheets, all of these analyses, a lot of these guys will come by and they'll show you, geez, if you invest X number of dollars today and it earns a certain amount of money, or if you choose to take some money out, here's what it's going to be worth 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. Everybody wants to see that projection because they all want to know the simple answer to a question, will I run out of money? But the one thing that most advisors will neglect to tell you, and I'm telling you this on the radio right now, every single one of those projections is a lie. Now, that's not what people want to hear, but the reality is, is that your life is not that green line that Fidelity talks about. Your life is going to change. You're going to make more money. You're going to make less money. Kids are going to want money from you. You're going to want to spend more money and spend less money. The minute any of those things change, that whole analysis that was just handed to you is a joke. It's not coming true anymore. It serves as a baseline for today and for today only. Let me go to your Chapter 8, which I think really covers everything. It, it touches on investing in mutual funds, but this, uh, the, the concept of it is, is everything. And one sentence at the very bottom. Yet, despite millions of people owning mutual funds, only a small percentage of people actually understand what they own. And that's not just mutual funds. That's almost everything if you're not standing beside a professional showing you what to do and explaining what the world and the market is out there. Well, that's right. But, I mean, I think I also mentioned in the book that I think it's foolish for, many, for the average person to own individual stocks. I think it makes more sense in the world for people to own mutual funds rather than stocks because I think stocks are just way too risky for the average person. But, here's, but going back to your point, Michael, as it relates to mutual funds, here's what some people don't know. There's a mutual fund that's on the street today that is a very popular mutual fund. It's been listed as one of the number one mutual funds and one of the best managers. It's called the Fair Home Fund. Many people own it all across this country. What peop- and people see the performance on it was great. It's done fabulous. And so more and more people throw money into it. What they don't realize is that this mutual fund has nine stocks in the mutual fund. Nine stocks. And 50% of the money in this billion-dollar mutual fund is owned in two companies, AIG and Sears. Not the most convincingly uh, powerful companies that you might think you want to invest in today, but Mr. Berkowitz, who runs the Fairhome Fund, is taking a risk. And he believes the risk and the opportunity there is huge. If he's right, you'll make a lot of money. But if he's wrong, man, will you lose money quickly. And people are throwing money into this mutual fund thinking it's a diversified, well-balanced, well-constructed portfolio. You need to know what you own. 
Well, though there's a there, and not only needing to know what you own, it's it's the. Well, I'm going to take that back. I'm going to uh, emphasize what you just said, because it, it's the what you own. You can walk down the street, ask 20 people what an American is. You're going to get five or six, seven, eight different answers. Walk down the street and ask somebody what stock means. And most mm-hmm. people won't even be able to give you an answer to that. So here we are no. investing into something. We have no idea what it is because somebody told us it was going to make you money. That's exactly <laughs> right. And it's, and it's scary. You're going on blind trust. Sure. In fact, in my book, Retiring for the Genius, we try to present what I call is the formula for financial planning. Because like you just said, yeah, and I mentioned this in the book, if you stopped 100 people on the street and asked them to give you a definition of financial planning, you're going to get 100 different answers. Sure. The problem is that if you ask 100 financial planners for a de- definition of financial planning, you're still going to get 100 different answers. That's not good. No, no. If you want to hire someone to do financial planning for you, you need to have a basic formula or a basic structure to understand what financial planning encompasses. And in the simplest of explanations, I want you to think about three separate things. One is what I call discovery. One is what I call capital preservation. And the other is wealth management. Unfortunately, most people spend 99% of their time in the wealth management side. How did my investments do? Frankly, that is the easiest part. Managing money is the easiest part of a retirement plan. It does not take rocket science. If you can add, subtract, multiply, or divide, and you can do it on a calculator, you're going to be just fine. It's the other stuff that matters. So here's the discovery part. The discovery part is, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? What are you going to do with your time? How are you going to spend it? What are some of the things that you've done so successfully that you want to do even more? And what are some of those regrets that you might have had in life that you may want to fix? You want to talk about a lot of things as it relates to discovery, really exploring what do you and your spouse love to do together? How do you want to spend your times in the evenings, on the weekends, during the days? What are those goals and objectives? There's a lot of time that needs to be spent exploring that. You just can't sit by the television and eat out for retirement. No. You've got to do more than that. Well, let me tell you what I think. Second you, part. Well, but before we go to the go second ahead. part, which I think is, uh, I'm going to use the G word, the genius part. One of the most yeah. important things that, that, uh, that I'm seeing here, because I'm, I'm going through the book as you're talking, you know, multitasking here. But, you know, yep. we can talk, we can talk technical, we can talk stocks, bonds, that, that, you know, it goes on and on and on. But the way you've done it is you've given an example of somebody who actually put to use what it is that you were talking about. The average guy, right. the, the professional, the whatever. That's what's relatable more than anything else. Because you can have somebody, you can talk to them night and day and give them technical information. It's going to go to the front of the brain, the, uh, the logical part. Go to bed at night and get up in the morning. It's gone. But by giving somebody, giving somebody an example of somebody like they are or close to it, it goes to the emotional part of the brain. They recognize it. It becomes familiar, and that's what stays with them. That's why the book will be a success for those people who put it in their hands. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that I, I tell you on this radio and, and everywhere else where I've been talking to folks. Every story that you find in that book is not fabricated. Every story is the story of an actual client who has walked through my office. Now, I've changed the names and who they are and their location and all that sure. stuff, but these are all true stories. And it was funny, um, about two weeks ago, this book just launched a couple weeks ago, we hosted a, um, a boat cruise for some of our clients in Salem, Massachusetts, and we handed out a copy of the book to all of our clients that were on the cruise, and I told them, look, you might find yourself in this book. Um, it's going to be a different name, of course, and they were all very interested to see if their story was in there. And uh, there's lots, of, and that's what makes this book, I think, rather unique. Rather than somebody sitting and speculating what they think someone should do, here's how someone reacted. Here's what the situation was, and here were a lot of the decisions that had to be made to put that goal, to put that objective into action. And sometimes it doesn't work out as planned, no. and you have to prepare for that. Yeah, and, and I think that, that's the key word. You've got to prepare for it. You've got to know what it is that you have to define your destination, so to speak. You have to know what it is that you've got and what you can do with that. And what I like about you know people like yourself the, the market's going to change, what, 100 times a day. I mean, there's always something different going on. But right. that's the business that you're in. You're watching everything that changes and how to compensate for that change, up, down, backwards, whatever the case may be. Where the average person, and I don't care how much money they have in their pocket or in the bank or investments, we don't do that. That's right. And I'm, like, take 2008, 2009, what, the market dropped 
a lot, from, from yeah. uh, 14,000 down to 6,600 on the Dow. Everybody wondered, what are we supposed to do? And a lot of people asked, did we sell our clients out? And at the end of the day, the answer is no. But we took a lot of calls and a lot of questions from our clients that said, how far does the market have to drop before I sell out? Well, what ended up happening was actually um, Columbus Day weekend of 2008, just after the market had fallen 2,000 points in two days. We got a lot of calls that, next, that Monday morning. I'll bet you and did. people were worried. Yeah. And they said to us, Mark, I can't sleep at night. I need to get out. And you know what? When you can't sleep at night, that's the time to get out, though I know you, it's not the smart thing to do. I still don't want you doing anything crazy. We want you to sleep well. But what happened for the 40 people, 40 of my 450 households in my office, called to get out? Half of them were back in by the following Friday. And here's the reason why. They said it was more difficult being out of the market and watching the fluctuations and the gyrations of everything that happened than it was being in the market. Because all they sat and worried about was, oh, my God, look how much money I could have made today. Yeah. And if you just left it alone, if you let it be rational, and the bigger part, if you recognize that your investment account is just one part of your overall financial well-being, of your overall retirement plan, and if it's set up properly, of course, no, you and need not worry. I mean, you can worry, but need not sure. worry as much. Uh, the market, the market is it's it's cyclical, like anything else. You know, it's going to drop. It's going to come back up again. And the key is, and I'm not a financial expert, but the key is, is when it drops, that's the time to keep it. That's the time to buy because sometime it's going to go back up again. Right. Well, the, the, the big joke that's out there is, look, when tuna fish goes on sale for three for a dollar, people run out and buy it, right? Yeah. But when the stock market drops thirty percent, people want to sell it. Yeah. They don't want to buy anymore. Now, intuitively, we know it's the right thing to buy low and sell high. But you rarely find individuals who consistently buy low and sell high. That's, that's what's called, and, and you can try to time the market. Um, we, we totally avoid market timing. I don't believe it, and I talk a lot about it in the book. Because I do say that market timing is something that you have to get right twice. You have to know when to get in and when to get out and when to get back in again. You have to know those things. Yeah, Mark, let me, let me, hold, one, yeah. Let, let me hold you up. We are, we are out of time, and I could talk okay. about this all night long, but let's do this. Uh, a website we can find you at, plus the other genius books. Yeah. Okay, first, the website that you can find us at is retiringgenius.com. That's retiringgenius.com. You can follow me on Twitter at retiringgenius. Um, and the other uh, four of the genius books that are out right now, they include um, fundraising for the genius, Caregiving for the Genius, and Obamacare for the Genius. And there's lots more coming. There's 43 different books in the works in the For the Genius series. We're looking to compete with the Dummy series, with the Idiot series. I think you're going to love this. My book's called Retiring for the Genius, Your Blueprint for Planning a Comfortable Retirement. Dynamite. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time and what you're doing. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.